Hi, my name is Dhruba. Um, I'm here to talk about some of the internal architecture pieces in Rockset. So as most of you are familiar, um, I'm going to talk about Rockset's internal architecture. Um, we use something called the aggregator, aggregator leaf tailor architecture and that powers Rockset. Um, I have done a whiteboard session on this earlier. We talked about a lot of these things. Today in this session, I'm going to focus mostly on the tailor. So what is unique about, the, about Rockset's tailor, which is the one that does continuous ingest into Rockset? Um, before we deep dive into the, into the architecture, maybe I'll first write down what are the requirements that we kind of use to design this tailor, right? So, so again, if you look at the tailor, the tailor requirements, the primary requirement of the tailor is that it has to be real time. So Rockset is a real time analytics database, which means that things need to happen in real time. And what is real time? So the tailors are designed with something called data latency latency in mind. So what is data latency? Now, let me explain that for a second. Um, so let us say you have data coming in into your system. This is new data. These are event logs or, 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 or transactions that you're doing in your operational database and you want to f do analytics on it. So as soon as data comes into your, or, or as soon as data is generated, there's a delay from the time when the data is generated to the time when it is visible to your applications. Let's say your applications are here and you want to make some SQL queries on your data to power those applications. So the time between when your data is produced here, this one till the time it is available for queries is what we call as the data latency of your app, right? So <clears throat> traditional systems that you might be familiar with uh, let's say warehouses or other databases in general, you might have a data latency of an hour. Like I used to work in the Hadoop system earlier. So there the data latencies of an hour are very acceptable. In Rockset, the requirements of data latency is that it has to be less than one to two seconds. So this is the primary use, primary design objective so that how can we make sure that the tailors that we are talking about has can run as fast as possible and the time between when it is produced or the time when you can do analytics is less than one, one to two seconds. So that's one of the primary design goals. Uh, there are other design goals as well. The second design goal would be something like, um, let's say you are, you are updating uh, different pieces of a record, um, atomic updates. Let me explain what that one is. So Rockset is a mutable database which basically means that you can update fields in a database unlike other traditional data systems which are very much read only. So for Rockset, every piece of data is updatable. So then when you update, the question of consistency comes up and a lot of people ask us questions about if I update different fields of the record, are they get, do they get updated atomically? So yes, so one design goal is that if you update different fields in the record, they get updated atomically and it's visible atomically in your SQL applications. And like I said, um, the entire system is built with mutability in mind, which basically means that every piece of data is changeable and every record has an underscore ID that uniquely defines the record. So any document that you put into Rockset, you can update it by specifying the underscore ID and saying that this particular field of the database, can I mutate it or can I update it to a new value? So these are the primary design goals of, of the tailors. So if I double click on the tailors and see how is it, uh, what, what is the high level, what are the high level components that make up this tailor? So new data is coming in from here. Let's take a concrete example. Let's say new data is coming in from Kafka, right? A lot of people have data coming in from Kafka. These are maybe Kafka event streams that are generated by your app. So we have two pieces of software that, that handles this. So one piece of software is called the ingester coordinator. 
So these are sources. Let's say there's a Kafka source, there's maybe a Kinesis source, and you have data coming in from two different sources. For each one, there will be a separate piece of software called the ingester coordinator. Again, these are all, this is not a single machine, this is a tier of machines, but this is a software logical component. The ingester coordinator is responsible for coordinating, managing these sources. So there's one ingester coordinator per source, and when new data, and, and, and then there are these things called ingester workers. You can very clearly see that uh, how we are making it scalable at, at cloud scale, right? So the coordinators are different from the workers. The workers are the ones which do the heavy lifting of data from Kafka into Rockset. And the coordinators are kind of the managers. But there's a coordinator per every source. So it's not like one source gets affected or impacted by another source data coming in. They're all separate. So the ingester coordinator, what it does is that it knows that there is some data to be read from this Kafka stream. And it knows that there are these, let's say, worker one and two, uh, the heartbeat to the coordinator. And, then, and this guy knows all the worker who has idle time on their hands. So let's say these two workers say that they can do some work on behalf of this coordinator. This coordinator tells this worker as part of this request response saying that, please take this data from Kafka. And so this worker is the one that does the heavy lifting of reading from the Kafka stream. Uh, similarly, for this ingester, there'll be another coordinator, let's say coordinator two, and this is coordinator one. He will also be talking to the same workers. And there is a, like a cross channel communication between the workers and the coordinators. And depending on whoever has least amount of load and other uh, characteristics, the, this coordinator for this job might give more work to these same workers. The job of the workers is to take this data format. This data format could be, let's say, JSON, right? Or it could be Avro format, typically in Kafka. Its job is to take this data and then standardize it into a standard rock set format. Why do you do this? We do this so that you can have different sources with different types of data, but they all can get processed by our our database engine in exactly the same way. So, so these workers, they write this Rockset standard format, which is actually a protobuf format. It's highly efficient um, so that we don't spend too much CPU in processing the protobuf later. It's kind of very efficient for log, logging. We come up with a protobuf format and we write it to a distributed log. I'll call this the DL, the distributed log. It's a temporary buffer, right? Temporary buffer. It's not persistent. I mean, it's, 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 it's persistent, but it's not there for the entirety of the data. It's for a small duration of time before it gets indexed in the, in the leaves, which I'll talk about. So what is in the distributed log? The distributed log um, is here because all this data that is coming in uh, oh yeah, there's one more. There's one more reason that I'm going to show you. There's also the write API, so, which means that you can actually deposit data into Rockset using something called the write API. It's like the write. Uh, it's like writing to a file or writing to a database, right? So you can actually write from your application using the write API. And the focus is that how to not lose all this data and make it durable as soon as data comes in. So this is the reason for the distributed log here. Once the data hits the distributed log, the write API returns success, and then you can be sure that your data will be processed by Rockset. Now this data might not be visible in the queries immediately, but that data latency is one or two seconds from the time it appears here to the time when it is queryable in the, in the engine. Um, there is something called the ingester workers. Uh, there's something called transformations. So these are called SQL transforms. So, Rockset supports something called rollups, and rollups um, by design, part of the rollups can run as part of the SQL, as part of the ingesters, and part of the rollup would actually run as part of query time. So the part that runs as, as part of the ingesting actually runs inside the ingester. So this is a good way, so this is, you can very clearly say, see now why these two layers are separate. This can be a layer that is, um, that is basically bottlenecked on compute. So this is a Kubernetes tier, for example, and so when it is bottlenecked in compute, 
you can scale this tier when there's more work to be done. So this is what it means by being cloud native, is that the design of this ingesting framework is very much cloud native and also the focus is on real time where as soon as data arrives, it needs to go back, go into the indexing engine to be processed in queries. <clears throat> uh, as far as the right API is concerned, the right API could directly go to some another process uh, called the receiver. Again, it does some transform and then it writes it to the distributed log, right? So again, these are all uh, scalable tiers. There's not one server, although in this diagram I have drawn it as one round box, but essentially these are Kubernetes tiers that can scale up and scale down. Um, if you look at um, the distributed log, yeah, so there's one more thing out here that I talked about in the previous, um, previous uh, whiteboard description is that the distributed log basically gets tailed uh, into a tier called the leaf. So again, if you look at the ALT architecture that I discussed in my previous whiteboarding session, we are talking about the tailors, but the leaf is where the data gets indexed from the distributed log, right? Um, just for uh, completeness purposes, so this basically uses something, an open source uh, layer called RocksDB Cloud, and it indexes the data there and it writes it to S3. So this is a pure, compute only tier. There is no um, there, there is no permanent storage. I mean, it uses data to index, but the storage is in S3 and this is all compute based tier. So the reason I mentioned this is because it will be helpful to explain about bulk ingest. That's another feature that Rockset has in the future. Um, so now let's talk about, now once this picture is clear in our head, let's talk about the intricacies of let's say a Kafka, uh, Kafka stream, right? So I'm going to simplify this a little bit. I'm going to talk about only a Kafka stream and let's say one worker. Um, because we have these rollups, rollups essentially means that we have to have as a capability called exactly once execution. You know why? Because let's say you are counting the number of events that have appeared in your stream, right? If you don't have exactly once, then you're going to double count those things. And so the, when you make a query saying, find me all the, the count of this uh, URL of this event, you might have more than what is actual in reality. So how do you do exactly once execution? Now this is a pipeline. These are all uh, CPU based uh, or CPU um, based tiers. So you can actually shut it down and make them come back. But if you if they shut down and come back, they have to know that they should not process data that has already been processed. So to do exactly once execution, there are two things we need to do. One is uh, checkpoints, and one is something called update IDs. So let me explain each one of them in great detail, right? So what is a checkpoint? So let us say the Kafka stream, so every Kafka stream is identified by a topic uh, partition and an offset, right? So the worker is going to read a message, a Kafka message with a topic partition and offset. And then when it writes this message to the distributed log, it writes an update ID. So the update ID in the case of Kafka is topic partition and offset. So this goes into a distributed log and it goes to the leaf. Now the leaf, Suppose it receives the same message, or it receives a message with the same update ID as topic partition offset that it had already processed before, then the leaf is going to ignore that second message. So this is, the re this is how we implement exactly one semantics all the way in our data pipeline. <clears throat> and the checkpoint part is, uh, let's say the ingester worker is processing this message, and then say after that the system shuts down for some reason and it comes back alive. We don't want to start processing Kafka from the beginning of time. We need to process offset plus one, right? So in this heartbeat mechanism that the worker has with the coordinator, the coordinator actually writes a checkpoint to S3. Um, this is the checkpoint place that the coordinator is writing a checkpoint to S3. Um, and the checkpoint has topic partition and offset that has been processed. 
So there is uh, intricate communication between the workers and the ingesters on what all it's processing so that the code editor can keep persisting this to the checkpoint storage. The key part is that the workers don't checkpoint directly, it's the coordinator that, that checkpoints because the worker's job is essentially to scale up and down based on how much data is coming into, into the system. It also makes it easier for the checkpoint to be consistent because it's only one entity that's writing a checkpoint, whereas for the workers, if you have different Kafka partitions, they would all be handled by different workers in parallel and being written to the distributed log. So this is the reason why the checkpoints and exactly one semantics is more or less handled by the framework and the leaves and the queries that you make on the leaves never see uh, the same record twice. Um, this is as far as Kafka or streaming sources are concerned, right? Now, how do you make this system handle not just streaming sources, but let's say uh, a bulk sources? Uh, right, so in that example, let's take a new example where your data is all in, let's say, S3 or GCS or Google Cloud Storage or Azure Storage, right? So these are bulk storage, which basically means that you have a lot of data and you want to ingest them quickly uh, as well. And uh, for real time analytical applications, sometimes it's important to join data between the Kafka stream that you got earlier and the data that you already have in your cloud storage. So same thing again. So there's an ingester coordinator for, let's say, an S3 path. Uh, I'm going to take S3 as an example. So the S3, let's say you create an S3 path there. So there's an ingester coordinator who decides that this S3 path, all the objects needs to be ingested. It hands out work to separate workers, saying that worker one, can you ingest the path S3 slash one? So this will go ingest the path S3 slash one. It might tell this guy to say S3, path two, right? So all the sub paths or all the sub objects inside the path will get processed in parallel by the ingester workers and they get stored again to the distributor log. This side of the story is exactly the same irrespective of what the source is, right? Whether it's S3, whether it's Kinesis Kafka or whatever format this one is. S3, sometimes a lot of the files in S3 are parquet format. So the ingester worker knows this and it can change parquet to run the SQL transform that we have specified and write it out as protobuf to our framework. Um, for S3, there is one more challenge for ingesting in real time. It's about bulk, bulk ingest, right? So what is bulk? Bulk essentially means that let's say you have, um, I'll just pick a number, 50 terabytes of data in S3 and you want to ingest. Now, because the amount of data that you have is so big compared to let's say a streaming source, this framework has to handle this differently of how he can ingest this data quickly into, into Rockside. Uh, so there are two sides to this story, right? One is um, doing this SQL transform and writing into the distributed log. And the other one is the leaf, which is actually doing the indexing work in here. So this is the CPU needed to do the indexing. In Rockset terminology, these leaves are called virtual instance virtual instance, it's all, which in short, we sometimes call it the VI, right? So the VI is the one which is doing the indexing, whereas the ingester framework is what is doing the transformations and the mapping. So when you have 50 terabytes of data, um, people sometimes will say that, oh, the cost of indexing this 50 terabytes is super high. I can't afford to have so many machines to index 50 ter terabytes of data. But the architecture that we have because it's cloud friendly, uh, I'm going to show how this, is, this can be done very efficiently and really good price performance and also do it in a very fast way. So let's say you have 50 terabytes of parquet data. Ingester coordinator runs exactly like this. Workers run it right in the distributed log. The challenge is how can you do this indexing work on the VIs as quickly as possible? So instead of using the regular VIs in this case, what Rockset does, it uses something called a bulk virtual instance. So a regular VI probably has, let's say four CPUs to say 500 or maybe a thousand CPUs. But a bulk VI can actually, we can actually allocate thousands of CPUs to do this indexing. So it's exactly the same code that's running on the leaf, but now these guys are running on gigantic machines uh, which have a lot of CPU. 
the tail list data that is in the distributed log, just like regular VIs, but the processing power of these VIs is large because they have a lot of CPU. And because uh, the VIs use RocksDB, so RocksDB has great options of how you can trade off space or storage versus the compute you need to index. So in the bulk mode, RocksDB automatically configures itself to uh, do to not do compact when data is coming in, but do one gigantic compaction at the end. So RocksDB will start storing indexing indexes all the files and start storing here in local disk as well as on S3. And then when the bulk job is done, when all the 50 terabytes are done, RocksDB is going to do a gigantic compaction once at the end, instead of compacting for every write that's coming in. And then once the compaction is done, it writes that output to S3 back and then shuts down this machine. So now you would see that to process 50 terabytes, we might have to keep this bulk VI alive for let's say one hour, right? With thousands of CPUs. But that one hour, it might be a few dollars to be able to spin up this thousand CPUs for one hour and process this 50 terabytes. Versus if you had an on-prem system earlier in the last decade, you would have to actually buy these thousand CPUs and keep it in your data center for the entirety of this lifetime. So because this is on the cloud, we can afford to index these large data sets very, very cheap and really fast because we spin up compute and when they're done, we shut them down. So once the bulk VI writes it to S3, the same S3 buckets are read by the normal VI and then they get served in the SQL queries that come in from this side. Right, so this is how bulk works. There's one more uh, interesting thing about the bulk is that Let's say that you have a database instead of S3. So Rockset also supports database CDCs, right? So I'm talking about, let's say, DynamoDB. You have, you have your transaction logs in DynamoDB or even MongoDB. You have, your application is using MongoDB as its source of data. It's doing some transactions there. And you want to do analytics on Rockset. So, how does our ingesting framework handle this case? So let's say this DynamoDB database has, again, I'm going to say 10 terabytes of data, right? Um, <clears throat> so Rockset, what it will do is that, uh, I'm going to remove this part uh, and this part. So Rockset, what it will do is that, uh, it will start off, the ingester coordinator understands that this is the DynamoDB database and it has a large data set. So it tells the worker Let's say this worker is picked to do data to do the data copy from this DynamoDB. It knows that this is the first time we are going to index this. So there is something called export to S3. This is the DynamoDB feature. So Rockset uses lots of advanced uh, DynamoDB features. One of the features the DynamoDB provides is the ability to export the entire database into S3. So Rockset, this worker, Rockset will automatically call this saying, export this data to S3. This 10 terabytes might take say 15 minutes to export to S3. And then Rockset will start using this bulk ingest framework from S3 to ingest it into, in, into, our, into our leaf. So again, the, here the, 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 the real timeliness comes because the ingester framework in Rockset leverages all the new features that a database has. Similarly, DynamoDB has something called DynamoDB streams right? Mm. DynamoDB streams. So this is again a much newer feature, feature in DynamoDB. It lets you do CDC stream on Dynamo. So Rockset workers, after he's done doing the bulk ingest from S3 through the bulk ingest and putting it in Rockset, it switches automatically to the tailing the DynamoDB stream. So it's going to look at, so let's say there's another worker here. This is done in bulk. Now it's going to look at the stream that is coming in from here. It will index, it will change it into, do the same things about SQL transforms and write it to the distributed log to be served by queries. So this is another point where the ingester framework has to be competent enough to make sure that yeah, there's no missing data between these two. So there is a checkpoint uh, or there's a, uh, there's a point that you get when you export to S3 and then when you switch over to using DynamoDB streams, the ingester workers and the coordinator are intellig intelligent enough to make sure that you don't lose data when you switch from one system to the other. Um, there are similar intricacies also exist with say 
kinesis, right? Let's uh, talk about kinesis for a second. Mm -hmm. So you have a kinesis stream, and unlike Kafka, kinesis has something called resharding. So you can say kinesis, this is a new feature in kinesis where when you write more data into kinesis, it actually reshards into multiple small shards automatically. So again, here the ingester workers have to be f f uh, competent, uh, competent enough to first read the parent shard of kinesis, and then when the shards split, it has logic to be able to follow the child children shards and put it into the distributed log and ingest from there. Um, again, these things happen, like sometimes shards appear, uh, let's say every minute or so, because there's a lot more work going on in kinesis. And so the core, the workers are, are very reactive. They immediately d detect this using kinesis APIs and start having more workers when uh, there's more shards in kinesis to be tailed. Mm. Uh, talk about efficiency. I'll give you another example of how, what are, what are the challenges about efficiency? So let's talk about MongoDB, right? So same thing as Dynamo, we take um, the whole database and we do a scan and we put it into rocks at first and then we go into the CDC streams in MongoDB. So MongoDB has something called a CDC stream. And the CDC stream, uh, there are a couple of ways how CDC streams behave. You can configure MongoDB to uh, produce a CDC stream which is the entire record or you can produce the CDC stream which is only the fields that got modified, right? In our case, the, the workers request MongoDB to produce only updated fields instead of the entire CDC stream. So this is useful for an efficiency purpose because if your records are big, you don't get the entire record in the updates. You can get only the updated field and the ingester workers, because our system is mutable, you can actually update the relevant field in Rockset uh, using just the updated field that's coming in the CDC stream. So efficiency is super important. This is the reason why uh, we try to leverage features of the database to be able to get you the most efficient way to copy data from your transaction databases into Rockset. Um, so that is kind of uh, some of the critical points that we try to take into account to build the real the real time um, indexing or real time ingesters. Um, again, to kind of summarize the reason why we built it in this this way is um, we definitely wanted the data latency of the system to be less than one or two seconds. This is the primary requirement like we explained earlier. Uh, we, this is the reason why the whole system is real time. In the sense when you have data, you can query it as soon as it is produced. And we also kept a lot of focus on efficiency uh, and price performance because the reasons of how we do bulk ingest, for example, the way how we do CDC stream update, they're all focused on high performance and giving you the best price performance as far as the engineering backend is concerned. So this is this sums up um, the things that I thought I will explain in the whiteboard. If you have more questions, please uh, ask us in like community.rockset.com and I can hang out and answer more questions. Um, in the future, I plan to do more whiteboard sessions on the query engine and other parts of our, uh, of our system. So please stay tuned and thanks for your time.